So our host for this panel is getting her microphone now. Is uh, Astrid Söderberg Widding. She is the rector for Stockholm University. We then hear from Lea Rynänen Kargalainen. Yes. Chair of the board, University of Eastern Finland and Executive Director of the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies. Kurt Rice, Director for Oslo Metropolitan University. Hey, and Jon Atli Benediktsson, Rector for Haskola Islands, University of Iceland. So please, Astrid, thank you. Uh, so I will, just like David Boots Pedersen uh, yesterday, I will have this impossible double role of both being part of the panel and hosting the panel, so I will try to do my best. Uh, and I would like to start by asking my colleagues, rectors and academic leaders, uh, what your background is in relation to open science. Uh, how have you, because you could possibly be a rector or an academic leader without ever having dealt with these questions. But what about you? Please. Yeah, I'll start. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my background is probably a little bit different than most of you. I'm, I'm a church musician by my background. And um, so I spent yesterday a couple of hours in thinking how, as a musician, I approach open science, open art, what happens in my head, in my heart, uh, how open uh, my uh, publications, written music is. There are IPR issues um, uh, in the field of music and art. And on the other hand, it's a, a big question of uh, interpretations, and, and so on. Uh, but I, when I did my own PhD, um, I was probably one of the first church musicians who started to talk about feminism and gender studies and qualitative research at the Sibelius Academy. And um, the community there was quite closed for those issues. I was even told that don't mention those things in your application. But I found, I was happy and lucky to find uh, other communities, other scientific communities to welcome me and start the discussion. So uh, I emphasize a lot of, uh, of open communities and, and since I've been working for 15 years as a manager and in leadership positions in the academic world and also in the private sector, I emphasize uh, open leadership. So we can come back to that, yes. I think. Thank you, Kurt. Please. Right, so <clears throat> my own engagement with open science, um, maybe like many other people here, has been primarily an engagement about open access and publication, which I've been engaged in for a long time. So several times over the last two days, uh, people have mentioned the Norwegian um, publication registry uh, that we have, and I led the board of that organization <clears throat> for six years. Um, and uh, so now I lead a university that has an extremely high compliance rate, uh, with requirements about archiving uh, articles. And I think that the, the success story there is the kind of thing that we haven't uh, touched sufficiently on about cultural change and about uh, you know, what, drives, yeah, what drives cultural change, what kinds of things motivate people. Some of my colleagues are motivated by the fact that we're best at archiving and they want to be part of that and they want to contribute uh, to that. But I've also been uh, engaged in these issues uh, related to my uh, interest in the failure of the peer review system um, and the relationship between um, uh, um, uh, what is Fusk called in English cheating in research mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> um, and open data. So some high profile cases where prominent researchers have seen their careers implode because of, of, um, of dishonest approaches to research perhaps would have been uncovered by openness. And that's something that I've written about a bit and been engaged in in Norwegian debates. Thank you. You're not clear. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here with you. Um, I have, um, I mean, mostly addressed this issue, I would say, as a researcher. So um, I, w I have been an editor-in-chief of a 
closed journal, we can say, or a hybrid green journal. Um, I have um, worked on that for maybe 10 years when, when this uh, first came to our uh, platform, I would say. Uh, I'm still uh, associate editor of four journals that are not open and one open access journal. So I've addressed it that, like that. And then I would say I've also, as a university administrator, um, worked on making everything as open as possible. So, I mean, this, these uh, items are a little conflicting, I would say, but, I mean, in general, I'm very pro-open access. So, I think uh, for society, I mean, the research usually is publicly funded, and it should be open. But uh, it also should be noted that the quality of the publications is key, and that's uh, very important in academia. So we are uh, trying to change the culture very rapidly. Ten years ago, I mentioned this came, came up uh, in an administrative committee meeting where I was presiding, um, open access of journals, um, and people from Europe said, no, no, this is not an issue here. It will not be an issue. I mean, how things have changed. Now we're talking about Plan S, and everything should change in 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there are some advantages, but there are also pitfalls. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I would say open access journals, that's one thing, and then open data. Um, in Iceland, we have uh, uh, law on open access journals for publicly funded from 2012, but we need to implement the strategy on that but we are just in the process of making everything open regarding data that are publicly funded. And that's a challenge in many ways, and I'm sure we will discuss this here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, to say a few words about my own history with open science, it started some 10 years ago, uh, with mostly focused on open access. Uh, I started one of the first Nordic-based open access scholarly journals in humanities, and I also took part in formulating an open access strategy for Stockholm University. At that time, I was associate dean, uh, together with Wilhelm Wiedmerk, who is today our head librarian. So we were quite early out at Stockholm University. And today I'm chair of the group for open access and the BIBSAM consortium at the National Library. And we are uh, the Swedish organization responsible for negotiations and deals with the publishers. I'm also chair for an open science group in the Association for Swedish Higher Education Institutions. So I actually devote lots of time, of my time as a rector to those questions. Uh, but I think, well, yesterday we had this nice panel of young researchers. Now we are the, the old ones, the established institutions <laughs> standing here. And I think that David Bats Pedersen uh, challenged us in a nice way yesterday when he said that the young generation is ready to move, but institutions have to uh, take this into account and in, in different ways to create informal rewards, to make open science count in hiring processes, etc. Are, are we ready to take on that challenge and in, in what ways do we do it to start very, in a very open way? <laughs> Uh, I don't know who. Who's. Well, uh, well, I can because I, I, I s I'm here on, on two chairs as a, as a uh, boss of a rector, <laughs> as a as a uh, chair of the of the university board, and and from that point of view, I think that uh, the board has a, a very important role to make the strategic choices of the university. And that's what we have done in our university strategy. It's, it's, very, it's one of the priorities. Of, the open science is one of the priorities. If, when you look at the websites of, of Finnish universities, you can, you can tell how they have, how, what, what's their attitude, the open science, whether, whether you can find open science issues on the front page if, if you have to go down to the research page and try to look if, if there are any instructions for, for researchers and, and, and educators. And, and, if, and there are, uh, unfortunately, a couple of universities in Finland, there's nothing on their website still. So uh, the board has a very important role in that sense, but uh, I think the general opinion is 
very positive in Finland. And, and I, can, I can say that from, from my other chair, which, which is as chief executive of the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies. Uh, Jyrki mentioned here the national coordination, and which is uh, sort of mandated to us from the Ministry of Education in the beginning of this year. So I spend most of the time at the moment of, of, of my working days uh, with open science issues. And, and, and when we got this mandate or one phrase in our funding decision from the ministry, uh, we asked, do you give us any instructions? And they said, no, as Jyrki said, the science community can decide. So that's what we have done the, the, the last 11 months, going dis having discussions with, with all possible members and participants of, of the science community. Do we need any coordination? What sort of coordination should we have? And on, on Monday and Tuesday, we have two very important days to, to realize these discussions. And um, I, really, I really hope that we can bring a, a researcher in the focus, because because it's, all, it's always up to the researchers, individual researchers, to, in the end, to realize these issues. I don't know whether I answered to your question, but just talk in that way. First of all, I'd like to say that I, that's not what I heard from the young researchers yesterday. What I heard from them was a strong commitment to the idea that you can read the quality of an article out from the title of the journal. And and that's a very conservative um, position and that I would encourage those organizations to reevaluate. But in my role as a, as a rector, I'd like to, uh, I would like to meet uh, those young early career researchers who uh, want a different approach to evaluation. Um, so uh, we've signed DORA also and we try to implement that. We have kind of a funny thing in Norway whereby we're required to use people outside of our own institution to make our hiring decisions. I think that's a really weird uh, system that we have, and among other things, it makes it difficult to instruct those committees successfully. And we talk about compliance here in a number of uh, contexts, and one place in which I also experience a massive failure of compliance is when I tell a committee that they should prioritize one thing or the other. And they, they don't do it because they have their own uh, vision of what it means to be a professor and either you match that vision uh, or you don't, something that's problematic in lots of ways. But one of the specific ways where we could really uh, make some changes is in acknowledging uh, the, the role of, of uh, you know, data. That, yeah, ownership isn't the right word, but the role that a researcher has done in producing a particular set of data and making it available for others to use. So how do you cite that, right? So my own field is uh, linguistics, and at the University of Tromsø, for example, they've uh, for several years been working on a repository for linguistic and language data, which organizes it in a way that makes it freely accessible, but also makes it clear how to uh, cite the person who's responsible for that data. And that kind of thing uh, uh, could help uh, with the transition if it actually was uh, gave merit to, to share your data in some way that was acknowledged publicly. Mm, yes. uh, this is a very good question. Uh, what we mostly look for when we hire people is the quality. Uh, we have an evaluation system that uh, sort of is very much based on the impact of journals and so forth. But, I mean, the culture is changing. And uh, we see that, uh, I mean, when I was uh, a graduate student, usually things were very closed. But now people are more and more talking about uh, openness, having the data open, having uh, programs. Uh, I'm an engineer. If you publish something, it, it is beneficial for you as a researcher to increase your impact. I'm not, not only looking at the impact factor, but just your influence to have things open. Uh, have the data open if possible, have the algorithms uh, available on your web page. And uh, when I was a student, you know, you try to sort of protect your data. Your data would increase your uh, possibility of analyzing the data. But now the demand is that more people can do what you have presented. So if you presented it openly, 
it will make sure that the influence is uh, uh, increased and also, obviously, it can create some criticism. Uh, at the University of Iceland, we have been promoting openness. Uh, we have uh, open science, we have advisors that uh, go, go ahead and um, introduce people to the subject. We are collecting data in repositories. There are two in Iceland at the moment. And what we see, which is I fi find very interesting, that more than half of our publications are open. So we are promoting it. But the, the negative side, I mean, what, what we are seeing, that most of the high-impact journals, they are not open, and we cannot diminish the influence of that. The quality is always important. So it's, again, it is a double-edged sword, sword, I would say. Yeah, and to connect to that, how do you see, are there any solutions that you could see? Of course, Plan S is one way. Uh, to try to solve this conflict in a way to flip the system. Uh, are there other possibilities? Kurt, you mentioned uh, some <laughs> openings. So, uh, how, how could we modify our assessment systems or reward systems? C could we find new publishing channels, etc.? Well, there's a difference between um, quality and visibility. And a, a high impact factor is not an indicator of quality, it's an indicator of visibility. Right? And so the journals that are most successful at getting very high impact factors make a big investment in creating visibility uh, for their articles. But for example, the positive correlation between retraction rate and impact factor is uh, something that we could uh, introduce into a discussion about the quality of those journals. So uh, I'm not a particular uh, fan of Plan S and because I think it doesn't go nearly far enough. Plan S uh, builds, rests on the idea that we can, in cooperation with traditional publishers, achieve the system that we want to achieve. But I don't see any evidence that traditional publishers are particularly interested in anything other than obscene profit margins. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest instead that what journals do uh, are, are really two things. They uh, facilitate distribution and they're part of our quality control system. And we don't need them for distribution. We can do that just fine uh, through archives and search engines. <clears throat> and the quality control system, as Yolanda pointed out earlier, uh, he thinks it's almost broken. I think it is broken. And, uh, and so we need other approaches to that also. So my preference would be that we uh, abandon the idea that cooperation with commercial uh, publishers is going to lead to a system uh, that's like uh, the ideal system we would make up if we sat down and started uh, thinking about that, and instead uh, that we consider the, the, the power of the internet in new ways and uh, use that as a way for distributing the results of science. Yeah, just uh, this question of, of the influence and the impact and the quality. Um, Obviously, you can have uh, a low-impact paper in a high-impact in a high-impact journal, right. but uh, what we always should look at the, the culture of the quality, the quality culture, because if you have a journal like uh, Nature or Science, uh, traditionally very high-impact journals, their reputation is at stake also in the review process. So uh, people find it important to publish in those journals and more, uh, can, we can say, specific high-impact journals in, in other, other disciplines. So uh, whether or not the paper receives many citations, it goes to a very strong review process, and that's important. So when we talk about going from the traditional scheme uh, that we have into the open access journals, I, I think that's, that's really good, but we should not destroy the system we have. So we have to find a bridge from what we have now in, into the future. And probably the, uh, the way forward is to make all these journals open that we currently have. Because if we look at the new open access journals, most of them are not high impact, and I, I know this is the impact factor is controversial in a way, but I mean, some of them are just new and they are establishing them mm -hmm. themselves. And then we are looking at uh, payment for publication rather than just the researcher submits to a journal and, and the people pay for accessing. I'm, I'm, I'm against that too, but uh, when you pay for the publication, uh, there are 
several conflicts related to that. When the number of papers increases, you, the journal receives more money and so forth. And um, I've seen it because I'm also uh, an associate editor of, uh, of uh, uh, an open access journal. They look forward to asking you to promote the journal in order to get more papers. And that's a different uh, situation for the uh, for the uh, volunteers that usually come from academia that are associate editors. So, I mean, there's just, there are new questions that come up. We are creating new journals, but we have to look at the culture. The quality culture is so important. And I'm not saying in the new journals it is not there, but we don't have any guarantee. That's the problem. Yeah, but we don't have any guarantee in the old journals either. But they have reputation, and you can look at that. Leah. Yeah, but <laughs> or do you want to? <laughs> no, I was just thinking about the bridge, the, 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 the bridge bu building the bridge between the current situation and, and the future. Because at least in Finland, we, are, we, we have had this uh, discussion on, on funding, funding the mm -hmm. domestic uh, scientific journals. Uh, the Federation distributes state subsidy uh, for approximately 200 uh, scientific journals. And, and in the publication forum, which is the, the, the system, I think in Norway you have quite a similar uh, thing to um, how the ministry distributes money to, to universities based on the amounts of publications, etc. Uh, and in Finland, 60% of, of domestic scientific journals are published by the scientific societies, which work on a voluntary basis. And, and for them, this is a big question, uh, how, they, uh, how they survive after subscri subscription fees disappear. And, and then we, are, we have tried to solve this problem the, for the last two years, and we, we are still in process. And probably on Tuesday, we have to do some rediscussion on, on how to continue with this project. But, uh, but this is when Jean Claude yesterday said that the, the publication issues are over, that that's, that has been solved. I, I don't agree with him. And especially on, on not in Nordic countries, we represent uh, small languages, and 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 uh, we really worry in Finland what happens with Finnish and Swedish languages, and as as languages of science right. there, and that's also attached now to a broader discussion of the future of Finnish and Swedish languages in Finland. So I think this is quite serious business. Yeah. Uh, we have that debate in Norway. Also. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, I would just like to say that I totally agree with Kurt that Plan S is not enough. It's only <laughs> like a first step. And what we really need to achieve is to <laughs> regain control over our own academic scientific work. Uh, and uh, its uh, distribution and its data. Uh, but. Uh, how to do that then? And, and here uh, Sven was uh, <coughs> handing over the question of how to create a culture promoting openness at, at universities. Uh, you have touched upon it a little bit, but I would like to, to take this question on, on the Swedish level now and say a few words about how we have been working. Because, well, if only perhaps four or five years ago, uh, when the Bibsam Consortium uh, was uh, a head librarian went to the, the rector's conference to present questions of open science, most of the rectors were quite blank in their eyes. They had really no, not, to, not a clue. And then there has been a really real change of culture in the discussion between universities. And that, I think, is also necessary because we can't have solutions at each university. We have to mm -hmm. agree on what ways to, to, to go and, and what, 
how to operate these changes. So I think that there has been tremendous change of culture in the last four or five years, where now actually university leaderships have understood that they have to take on these questions and that it is, it is not a, a, just some matter of... Uh, for librarians or a matter of publishing that doesn't <laughs> have, to, have to do with us as university leaders, but that we really have to, to take on this change of culture and that we have to lead the way. Our librarians may be excellent, but they cannot do that because that's not their task. So we have to work together within the universities and between the universities and also, of course, with, with the funders. And I think that national perspective is, is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and uh, I mean, the language issue is something we also look at in Iceland. Uh, we are, I mean, from Norway yesterday, it was mentioned that Norway is a small country. We have always <laughs> looked at Norway as a large country, so, <laughs> and we have a tiny language. But, um, I mean, ultimately, uh, I don't not like any, any money involved in this. Uh, so, uh, as a university administrator, I find it ridiculous to pay to publish, and I also like, uh, uh, do not like it to pay for all these subscriptions. Mm -hmm. the, the point is also, I mean, mentioning the, uh, the societies, the, the, so, the academic societies or uh, specific societies, they, it's a very good point to mention that they have uh, funding based on this and usually volunteers run it, but then they have some overhead, and uh, I mean, it need to pay for, need to, you need to pay for that. But uh, I mean, the final goal uh, would be to have high quality publications just on websites. You yeah. didn't need to pay for anything. Uh, so uh, I agree that we should go there. Just the question is, how can we reach that point? And obviously with Plan S to do it in 2020, I mean, uh, that doesn't work. I mean, we are almost there uh, in, with respect to uh, submission of papers and so forth, if we are going to publish in 2020. So we need to extend that a little bit. But um, I, I think uh, one of the reasons I support that is that there needs to be a sense of urgency in this because there's so much money involved and the taxpayers essentially are paying too much for this and uh, we need to change this rigged system. But I, I just want to stress the fact that the equality issue is so important. That's, that's something that should not be forgotten. Kurt, please. So, so um, I, can, I can share some of these, some of these views. Uh, and uh, we're very lucky to have the European czar of Plan S with us here today. <laughs> uh, and so uh, there is one thing that would make Plan S work by 2020. And that is, uh, if China would sign on to that plan, then uh, the even, even uh, probably even Elsevier would have to uh, flip its journals to uh, open access. In other words, uh, we, we've seen the impact of the requirements of the National Institutes of Health in the United States on issues related to openness, and it's been a profound impact. And the ambition of Plan S, as I perceive it, is to uh, amass such a sufficient coalition uh, of researchers uh, laboring under the regulation of Plan S that it forces a reaction from the publishing companies. And that particular aspect of the Plan S uh, debate seems to me to be underappreciated by its critics. So the, the goal of flipping uh, journals, which the, the Max Planck initiatives have been focused on for many for many years now. So my encouragement to Yolana would be get China on board and your job is going to be a walk in the park. <laughs> could that be a Nordic uh, initiative so yes, that we I all that could go there should. and we should, we should have a little discussion with right. Chinese uh, bosses? <laughs> right. Uh, mm. no, I, I would like to add something about, because uh, also Jan Arne said that researchers are not sensitive to the costs of publications, which is of course true, but we as universities have not been that sensitive either. Uh, it's only our head librarians who have been striving to keep their budgets who have been desperate. Uh, but uh, uh, so w one thing that we did in Sweden was to uh, collect information about 
the APCs being paid because uh, we, we had no idea of, we knew the subscription fees, of course, but we had no idea what we paid in APC. So now we have right. a total control over the system and how much we actually pay. And this also helps in arguing for the absurdity in this system that right. uh, we really <laughs> need to change. Um, but uh, on a more general level, then, uh, what, do you, what opportunities and obstacles do you see with this transition? Do, we have touched upon many of them, but... Uh, to plan S? No, to open, to, science. to open science. Well, I mean, I, I think we've touched on a lot of them, if I should yesterday, jump into it. Yeah, yesterday and today. But there's something about... Uh, there's something about um, the prestige associated, I mean, as part of the publishing story is the prestige that we give away as the professoriate to uh, journals. Part of the open data issue is the prestige uh, for any particular <clears throat> researcher of owning their own set of, uh, own set of data. And, and one could continue along those lines. And I think that the success of uh, transition to open science uh, rests less on successful articulation of policy and more on a successful articulation of the advantages to the individual researcher, right? So in my own field in linguistics, you know, maybe a typical PhD, one approach to a career is that as a PhD student, you go out into the jungle and you sit there for two years and you learn some language that nobody else knows and you collect a set of data that you're planning to build a whole career on, that you're going to write articles and books on for many, many years to come. And coming home and being forced to share that data is something uh, that you have to talk to me as a researcher about why it's good for me and why it's good for my career. And I think we should get away from uh, policy and compliance uh, top-down kind of discussions and rather try to appeal to a sense of uh, actually improving the quality of the individual's science and their career. And we have quite a ways to go on that front still, as we saw yesterday afternoon. So I think uh, the, uh, I mean, opp opportunities are there. Obviously, there will be more accessibility. That's very important. We we're talking about the journals. Uh, and um, if we, we are m mentioning this thing with the libraries, they pay a lot of money. It was discussed here with the Faroe Islands. We, they don't have access to all the journals. We don't either. We, are t we try to pay wh what we can, but uh, obviously we cannot pay for everything. And that r really diminishes uh, what we say can say the opportunities of our researchers in some cases. But I mean, I hate to see all this money go into, into this pot. So obviously, if we go to open journals, we will reduce that, but there are always pitfalls. Who pays? I mean, are the universities paying? Are the funders paying? And so forth. If we are going to run the system, that is now. But ultimately, if we don't consider this issue and we go into open publications in general, uh, the ultimate goal would be that nobody pays. I mean, just uh, you, you run your universities and uh, you can publish. I mean, that, that would be ideal, I would say. But then we have the problem who pays for the societies and so forth. But for the data, I think that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, we see it, for example, in Iceland, uh, we have uh, data in geosciences and health sciences and social sciences that we are opening up and we find it very important. For example, Iceland uh, in geosciences is in a way a laboratory that uh, is uh, interesting for researchers in the field. And if we have more data, it creates the opportunity, for open data, for researchers to work on our data and create new knowledge. And that's very positive, and that's in general. But on the other hand, there's always a pitfall there too. People can steal data, they can relabel the data, and I mean, there are always problems. But if we only look at the positive side, it will create more knowledge, more research, and more opportunities. And I think that's very positive. Yeah, I think we should try to avoid falling into the, the pitfall of just discussing 2020 or uh, later or sooner and all these technical questions. I think we have to really keep in mind that 
why open science is necessary is because it makes science better. And also that uh, I totally agree that the incentives have to be, that aligns, what you said, Kurt, aligns very well with what Jean-Claude Bergerman said yesterday, that uh, the incentives should be related to researchers. How will it help me finding a job, or making a career and getting more funding? So I think that is really where you have to start because if there is to be a change of culture, which I think is what we all agree upon, then it has to be both uh, bottom up and top down because mm -hmm. you can not only do it bottom up, but, but you need to meet the bottom up, but you, you cannot do it top down without any base. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I could say that uh, open science has given me uh, opportunities personally uh, in my my everyday work, uh, the federation in in uh, in discussions of this national coordination, and and as a as a chair of the board to challenge the the existing. Uh, organizational, managerial, administrative structures, ways, ways of working. As you said, it's a big, big change of culture. And, and I feel that I have been able to uh, use mm. the, the uh, topic of open, openness, openness of, the, of the scientific community, openness of, of the management. Helena. A way to improve it. Yeah. I think it's time for some Mentimeter questions. Yeah. Uh, is there a risk that uh, rewarding sharing of data make researchers do research which data is easy and fast to share? Can it affect different research fields? Well, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, so one thing that we've seen with the publication database uh, in Norway and connecting some very, very small amount of money to that is that it has a profound impact on the behavior of researchers. So uh, you have to be careful with all kinds of incentive introduction because people actually respond to it. Yeah, we, we've seen it with our evaluation system in Iceland, where people just uh, align their focus according to the incentives. And in a way, if we have a system like this, and if we want to push open science, mm. we should have an incentive for that, for sure. But uh, it is con con uh, at the moment under evaluation, so possibly we could do this. But since it's a part of our plan to make everything open, uh, it would be possible to include something like this. Do you agree? I I'm not sure if I understood the question. <laughs> Go on. Okay. Um, will open science also involve private companies making their data available, like Google, Facebook, and pharmaceuticals? <laughs> mm. I think they've made it available for purchase already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is uh, so to the extent that there is public-private collaboration in. Uh, on basic research, for example, that is one of the issues that has to be addressed, is that, is that private companies really have to dig deep and find it within themselves that they can share uh, data and allow publication of data because their urge is proprietorial, that they want to hang on to that data with the idea that they're going to make money on it. So mm -hmm. that is definitely uh, the cultural changes that we've been talking about also have to extend to other parts of the research infrastructure uh, ecosystem, including... Yes, the I think the, the change has to take place within the public sector first, because so that the private actors who want to uh, interact with right. <laughs> universities, uh, that they feel the need to, to, to adopt to these... Uh, to this new culture of an open science. Yeah, I, I, I totally, totally agree. I mean, that it has to be their choice, but we first look at the public funding, and uh, then, I mean, if we change the culture, that comes along with it. And, I mean, they may see opportunities in providing open data, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what thoughts do you have about uh, the emergence of open science and its impact on the replication crisis? Can you say it again? Yeah. What thoughts do you have about the emergence of open science and its impact on the replication crisis? Well, um, I think we don't understand uh, the science of replication well enough. Uh, so there are very complicated issues connected to replication. Um, but 
it seems obvious to me that um, making the full set of data behind an article available uh, increases the possibilities for doing replication studies, and that should be something we view very positively. Yes, I totally agree. I, I think that this could be a, a key, really, to, to, to changing. You know, another part of the replication crisis is the resistance of uh, so-called high-quality journals to publish replication uh, studies. And that's also something which a new approach to the distribution of scientific work uh, could have a positive impact on, and not just replication studies, but negative results uh, as well. So those are, uh, apparently, those are low-quality research findings <laughs> and can't get into high-quality journals. But we know that's not true, right? Those are really important research findings. Yes. Yeah. I have another question actually for you, Kurt. Um, I like your view on Plan S, Kurt Rice, uh, but what about social sciences and monographs? Can we handle slash maintain the quality with design, et cetera, without publishers? Uh, yeah, yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Uh, that's a different uh, kind of work, but uh, I think that just uh, what I would dare to call the explosion of open access monographs the last uh, few years shows that there are also new approaches to the publication of, of, of monographs. And, you know, reviewing, in, you know, in the humanities, in some ways, it's easier to publish a book than an article. Right? The, the, the threshold, the, the ritual of getting into a high-quality journal uh, is, <clears throat> is so endless, uh, whereas the ritual of getting a book approved for a publication still has a serious review process, but the threshold is more reasonable. Uh, and, and of course, open review approaches to monographs require people that are committed to engaging themselves with the monograph, but that's what we do in the humanities. Mm. Yeah, and we are the ones actually doing the, the, the review, so we as, as researchers, so of mm. course we, we, we do not need the publishers to maintain the high quality. And I also, uh, think that uh, for humanities scholars, when, when I started this open access journal, I was told that nobody in humanities will ever want to publish open access, but what was the incentive was that they actually saw that, the, that what they had written was read and spread in a way that <clears> it would <throat> never have been through a conventional publisher. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. really a key point. I mean. Uh, yeah distribution will be much easier and it will eventually have more influence. Right. Yes. And um, it was mentioned yesterday, uh, since we're talking about here reviewing um, uh, by Jean-Claude to have open reviews. Mm. Um, I, as, as an editor, have some problems with that. This, I know the system as it is is not, uh, not uh, entirely good. I mean, there are always problems, but uh, it is difficult at the moment to get reviewers. And uh, if you opened everything up, um, it will be, in my opinion, even more difficult. And uh, it was mentioned that uh, some people would get credit for the reviews if it's open. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's uh, something we could consider. But mostly now, it's young people that are working on the reviews. And, and I think people would be more afraid to review if it will be open, because now it is the editor-in-chief or the associate editors that make the decisions, and it's their, obviously, obligation to explain to the, to the uh, authors why, this is a, uh, why the decision is made. So I have a little problem with this, but I mean, everything is open for discussion. Here, I really disagree. I think it would actually improve the quality of the review system, and I think that the problem with this system now is the amount of publications that you have to <laughs> review, the amount of articles, and that has to do with the whole change of culture that we want to bring about, that it should not be quantitative measures that yeah. should count. So the, I mean, if you have, an, I mean, you've just published a paper or book on, online, and then people review and you revise as, as you go, I mean, that could be the ultimate solution, but mm -hmm. I'm just looking at the system as it is, it's very difficult to get reviewers, and I mean, the picture changes. But we could have a special session on this, I guess. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think soon Watson will be doing reviews for us, and we don't yeah. have that problem anymore. Probably. <laughs> and as a musician uh, and an artist, you have always been openly reviewed by everyone. So you can't produce, publish any 
bad quality. I, I would just like to end by referring again to what Jean-Claude Bugelman said, that this openness is really part of the academic culture, that was seminar culture, or academic culture, so I think that's right. I really like the idea of open exchange, uh, sure. also in reviewing. So, with time that, to sum up, I think. Yes, yeah. I, I just, well, I think the time is out, so I, I think uh, I would like to th thank my co-panelists so much thank for... You for discussions and for you. Thank you, Astrid. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.